about three to 5% of genes in the genome may regulate biological aging. I think at first glance, that seems like a pretty darn big number. I think a lot of people were surprised that, you know, maybe as much as 5% of the genes in the genome can have a significant impact on lifespan. Okay. So here's where I hope I'm going to blow your mind. I actually think the percentage of type 2 aging genes is much greater than 5%. And I have two lines of reasoning to support this. The first one is that even though people have done these large unbiased genetic screens in both yeast and worms, we've only explored a tiny, tiny fraction of what I would call the longevity intervention space. It, even for genetic longevity interventions, a tiny, tiny fraction. So one way to appreciate this is that in both yeast and worms, um, all of the large scale unbiased genetic screens have been what we call loss of function, meaning we're turning the volume knob down. In yeast, we're basically turning it off. <laughs> we, we asked, what is the effect for each individual gene if we take it from whatever level the volume knob's at, let's say seven, and we turn it all the way off. And we do that one by one across the entire genome. Now, lots of genes, when we do that, result in a dead yeast cell. Those are called essential genes. Same thing's true in worms, mice, people. There are lots and lots of essential genes that if you take it to zero, you get a dead organism. Okay. So we can't even look at those. But for all the others, we're basically looking at one level of expression. And the same thing's true in worms with these RNAi tools, except the level of expression in most cases isn't zero. It's something less than what it started at. And we don't even really know in most cases how much less. So basically it's like, you know, you just turn the volume knob, but you don't really know how far you turned it. Um, and again, we're only looking at one different level of expression. So we're stuck looking at loss of function, turning the knob down to some level, and we're only looking at one, one level down from whatever the normal expression level is. So that's a tiny fraction of the possible volume levels. And you could certainly imagine all sorts of variations on top of that, where maybe you turn it down for a little bit, and then you turn it up for a little bit, and then you turn it back down, right? So we're really not exploring all the possible intervention space um, in any meaningful way. And we're not exploring turning the knob up at all. We have essentially zero large-scale genetic screens looking at the effect of turning up genes on lifespan. So tiny, tiny fraction. And there's pretty good evidence that turning up genes can lead to lifespan extension quite a bit of the time. So especially if you combine the essential part, the essential genes, with turning them up. So we have one study from um, my good friend, Alateen Kaya, uh, who I've collaborated with, and I was a collaborator on this study. By the way, Alateen is one of the most innovative people in the field. Um, he keeps coming up with very, very cool ideas uh, that I think are high impact. So this is an example of that, where Alateen had the idea, what if we, one by one, overexpress essential genes. And there's good biological rationale for why that, that might be important and effective. And so we did a pilot study. We were fortunate enough to get a grant from the Impetus Grants uh, program to do a pilot study where we looked at a couple dozen of these uh, essential genes in yeast. And we just overexpressed them one by one. And we found that like half of them extended lifespan when we did that. So this that's the only study, and it's very small scale, that has even started to look at turning up genes or specifically turning up genes and looking at essential genes, but suggestive that there are probably a lot more aging genes out there than we know about. And we don't know about them because nobody's really looked. Um, the other sort of line of reasoning for why I would suggest that there's way more than 5% of the genes in the genomes that are type two aging genes is more of a, a evolutionary argument. So if you think about how evolution works, right? We're talking about evolution by natural selection. I want you to just think for a moment about what is natural selection acting on? What is the primary driving force of natural selection? That force is to pass, successfully pass the genetic information on to the next generation. That's basically what we're all about. Our goal from an evolutionary perspective is to pass our genes on to the next generation. And all of the genes in our genome, in principle, have been optimized through natural selection to do that, okay? So if you think about this at the individual gene level, at volume knob, right? Again, very simple analogy. 
natural selection is going to ensure that that you know with you can imagine a few rare uh cases where this might not happen but in general natural selection is going to ensure that that volume knob is set as close as it possibly can be to optimizing your chance of reproducing and passing your genes on successfully to the next generation, which means not just reproducing, but reproducing at the optimal level and at the optimal time. Okay, so now if we think about the volume knob in the context of biological aging, what is the force of natural selection to optimize that volume knob for optimal biological aging, optimal health span and lifespan? And I think most people would agree it's almost zero. Like there's very little reason for evolution to care whether or not we're going to live to 105, 110, 120 in good health. Um, and in fact, we can reasonably speculate that essentially none of our genes are going to be regulated. The volume knob is going to be regulated to be expressed in a way that optimizes for longevity and health span. So if a, an individual gene is in fact optimized for longevity and health span or for biological aging, it's pretty much by accident, meaning that optimal biological aging just happens to be similar to optimal reproductive fitness. And it follows from that that very, very few, if any, of our genes are going to therefore be optimized for longevity because it's very unlikely that that's going to just by chance line up with, with optimal reproductive fitness. And in fact, if anything, I think we've learned that those things tend to be counter opposed to each other, that, that, that in fact, optimizing for reproductive fitness often is, is suboptimal for biological aging. So, so given that, um, it must be the case that for the majority of genes, there is some other expression level or pattern other than what these things have been optimized for that would be optimal for longevity. And given that, it's very, very likely that the number of type 2 aging genes is much larger than the 3 to 5% that has been estimated from these, you know, very low coverage genetic studies that have been done in simple model organisms. So I don't know what that number is, but personally, I'd guess it's over 50% of the genes in our genome that if we could optimize those for biological aging would have a positive impact on health span and or lifespan. I don't know how big the impact would be, probably pretty small in most cases, but where you could actually make things better. And of course, in some cases, that optimization for biological aging may have side effects that, that are offset the benefits or make it impractical or undesirable for some reason um, to optimize for biological aging. But in principle, still, if we knew enough about the system, we could figure out what pattern of optimization gives us the best bang for the buck in terms of risk reward or side effects to benefits. But I think the take home here is that evolutionary principles essentially guarantee that there are many, many, many more opportunities to optimize longevity than we are currently as a field exploring. <laughs>